Please don't, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, short and incisive in your questions, not too long. So we can get a lot of different questions in. Following that, as I've been saying, we'll be going down to the fifth floor for more just personal interaction for our reception. So who wants to go first? Okay, Susan Chept, please. And wait till they bring you the mic. Could people just identify them? Yeah, say briefly your name and any oh, affiliation. My name is Susan Chept. Um, I teach, uh, you want me to stand? Yeah. Oh, okay. But I teach uh, psychology at Stevens Institute of Technology. I know Carol. <laughs> Carol From there. Gould. Yeah. Yes. My question is this. One of the, um, you mentioned boys being socialized into being boys at around five or six. Do you attribute do you still attribute some of that to Nancy Chodoro's idea of defensive separation, of how that boys and girls develop differently due to defensive separation? Oh, is that the question? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I'll tell you, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I really would prefer to use the phrase initiation to then to talk about socialization, although God knows as a psychologist I know that's what we talk about. <laughs> because, I mean, I think it's much more psychologically profound. And I think the idea that masculinity, this is Chodoro, is established through breaking relationship and betraying love is... Patri I mean, in other words, this masculinity is not free-floating. This is not culture-free. The masculinity that rests on a betrayal of love is the masculinity of patriarchy that rests on a gender, binary, and hierarchy. I mean, you know, these canonical stories, Abraham, I mean, Agamemnon, I mean, you can go Jephthah and his daughter... So I think that Chaudhara working within a psychoanalytic paradigm is, is basically reading culture as nature. And the idea that boys establish their sense of who they are by breaking with their mothers and uh, internalizing the, quote, voice and law of the father is really reading patriarchy as nature. And the interesting thing, I mean, so that... and. You know, Nancy wrote that in the 1970s. <laughs> so, I mean, the interesting thing, I think, is that a patriarchal, whatever you want to call it, religion, culture, family structure, ideology, and it usually isn't called patriarchy, at least in, you know, it's called tradition or whatever it's called, has a much greater investment in the initiation of boys. I mean, <laughs> that's crucial that you have to establish, and they're offered a great deal in patriarchy. I mean, that's the other thing, is they are offered privilege and power. They're offered, you know, to exist as if, it's a really wonderful psychological term, the as if phenomenon, as if they were autonomous. I always like to think, because, you know, Jim and I lived in New England for so long, of Ralph Waldo Emerson sitting in his study writing about autonomy while he's being maintained by a whole household. And if any of those people start to speak, this autonomy, it, I mean, you know, he can sit and write about autonomy because they've all, none of their voices are credible. The women, all the household help and everything else that's feeding and caring for and maintaining Ralph Waldo Emerson. So, I mean, the whole thing is how you make a, a structure, a cultural structure look natural. And I was very interested in Toba Hartman's and Charlie Buchholz's work. They're talking about the Jewish tradition, but they also write about, you know, Agamemnon. Um, they write about Iphigenia, and they write about Isaac. Is that even within the tradition, there's a sense that there is sense core values of relationship being betrayed. So I think what's happened is psychology has read patriarchy as nature. And what's interesting to me is that, and it's a, partly a discussion I would have with um, Virginia, uh, is children resist the initiation into patriarchy. 
and they develop very creative strategies, including these little four and five-year-old boys. Judy's book is coming out in the fall from NYU Press called When Boys Become, quote, Boys. Of how they, what they know, these four and five-year-olds, is different from what they show. And so they hold on, they don't lose, they may appear to lose their relational capacities, but they don't really lose them. So the masculinity that is achieved at the price of betraying love. In my book, The Birth of Pleasure, I write, I'm just, I don't want to answer too long, but I write about a man named Dan. And I always, I learned so much from him because he, and his mother were pals. They used to bake together when he was a little boy, four or five years old. But his closeness with his mother, I, I don't have this in, in this paper, but I don't know if you know how little boys read their mothers and their fathers. I mean, a five-year-old says to his mother, Mommy, why do you smile when you're sad? Another five-year-old says to his mother, Mommy, I hear a little happy, I hear a happy voice, but I also hear a little worried voice. Another five-year, four-year-old, Sam says to his mother, he says, Mommy, why are you sad? She has read psychology books, and she knows you're not supposed to burden your child with your sadness. That implies that your child doesn't know how you're feeling if you don't, quote, burden them with it. So she says... <coughs> I'm not sad, and what children will recognize as a fakey voice, that's what girls call it. And he says to her, four years old, he says, Mommy, I know you. I was inside you. <laughs> okay, and yeah. so what I'm trying to say is we make a deal with boys, including mothers too, which is if they, and we make this deal with girls, won't say what you know about me, the feelings that I don't want to know, you know, basically, that's the deal. And so the separation is made to maintain. Thank you. Um, I'll try Eva first and then that. And then, uh, no, I was <coughs> Okay. Now that's right here. It's coming. Kind of oh, wow. Oh, did I walk away from See, I think Charter's notion that girls don't have a self is just Oh, okay. Um, I've been sitting here trying to figure out which of the questions I have for you. And, and Virginia, I want to ask. Um, but the, the first thing I want to, I was, I think the idea that what we've been taking as development is really a response to trauma is really uh, a, a fascinating um, idea. And one of the things that occurred to me was um, you talk about the developmental stages for women's, girls' development. And would you reformulate in any way or rethink the way you characterized those stages? in light of this particular Oh, absolutely. Thank insight. you. Yeah, no, I absolutely would. I think what I was doing, because, I mean, if you remember in any different voice, uh, I mean, aside from that one 11-year-old ele Amy, there were no girls. So I had, it was a book, there's one girl, Amy, and one 11-year-old boy, Jake. And that's basically it for the kids. It's so interesting to me that that book is read as a book about children's moral development. It's not. So I'm dealing with women who have already dealt, internalized the split. So if they speak for themselves, they're selfish and bad. And if they sort of speak for others only, they're selfless and good. And the interesting thing for me, apropos this audience, is you have to situate my work politically. I mean, I am interviewing in the, in the 1970s. I start interviewing women, first of all, right after the 60s, and immediately after the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade. And suddenly you have the highest court in the land 
saying to women, you have a decisive voice in a decision, you know, that has serious ramifications. And so at that point, uh, I remember, <laughs> I mean, the thing just empirically, I would hear woman after woman use the word selfish to describe whatever she wanted to do. If she wanted to have the baby and other people wanted her to have the abortion, it was selfish to have the baby. If other people wanted her to have the baby and she wanted to have the abortion, it was selfish to have the abortion. So here's a wife of a law student, someone we can all relate to, basically. And she's having an abortion so her husband can finish law school. And that's what he wants her to do. She's supporting him. So I said, I understand. What do you want to do? She says to me, what's wrong with doing something for someone you love? I said, nothing. But what do you want to do? And after several sort of iterations of this use of the word selfish, I started to say to women, if it's good to be empathic and responsive to people and concerned about their you know, wishes and concerns, why is it selfish to respond to yourself? And in the aftermath, I cannot stress the political context more of the whole civil rights movement, the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade, woman after woman said to me, good question. And that whole morality that was silencing women in the name of love and relationships was recognized to be an abdication of voice and an evasion of relationship. They were not present in their relationship. Now the consequences, I'm a psychologist, as I said. I mean, I appreciate Virginia talking about you know, the ethics of this. Psychologically, if you're doing something you know, because of your concern and, and you're not present, they're responsible for what you do. So this exploded in its, its own contradiction, which is the women would either have the baby or have the abortion, and then, of course, blame the person. And so the very strategy designed to, quote, maintain relationship was, in fact, I mean, the, the relationships were exploding in the contradiction, you know, rather than dealing with the conflict. So, yes, that whole study was, I mean, that's why the 11-year-old's voice, Amy, stayed with me and led me to do the developmental thing, because psychologically, I couldn't connect her voice with the voices of the women. I mean, it just, and what happened is it was true of my graduate students then, they would do some work with girls, and the girls would score, you know, on where C, every stage is in a sequence, blah, 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 one after the other, and the girls would score stage two and stage five. Now, that's an incoherent score psychologically. You couldn't put them together. I'll give you a philosophical example, since, which is, um, who is it who's asked, I think maybe it's Amy, if she's ever had to make a decision where she wasn't sure what was the right thing to do, she says, yes, I had to decide whether to go to camp, and I didn't know if I went to camp and I had a miserable time, I wouldn't never know if it was better if I stayed home, and if I stayed home and I got really bored, I'd never know if it was better if I went to camp. So says Amy at 11, you've got to decide, but you'll never know. Now, that's the highest stage of William Perry's into stages of intellectual and ethical development, and she's, you know, 11. Most college Harvard students don't reach that stage, so of course it's incoherent to psychologists. So it really was... Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, Nanette, and, and then Paul. Yeah, I want to ask about your um, evaluation of resisting the repression of your voice because throughout your talk, it seemed as though that was a laudatory thing to do, and in some sense, liberatory and positive. But, um, you know, if you look at the historical development and this whole, quote, me generation and narcissism, sometimes these inner voices are very narcissistic, not just of, of girls, but boys too. And especially with this culture of um, 
you know, therapy, there are many who say, I have to now assert my voice. I've been in therapy for 20 years. I have to assert my voice. And out comes a lot of narcissistic behavior. And that would seem to undermine the possibility of relationships and caring for others rather than um, making it more possible. So I'm just wondering uh, whether you really, whether I'm misreading you in this very positive um, value you put on resisting repression of voice. I just have to say, I mean, I love these questions because you're really, I mean, asking, it's, uh, the assumption, first of all, <laughs> I mean, two things. The split between self and relationship is by definition narcissism. It's the loss of relationship where narcissists, you know, can't tell, I mean, he's, he's lost the capacity to differentiate between himself and others. I mean, he mistakes, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, for a relationship, he's basically not in relationship. He's relating to himself. It's like a person talking in an echo chamber. You know, that's why echo is his partner or whatever. The interesting thing you see is if you start with the psychology here, I mean, that's really what I'm asking is can we really have a discussion where the philosophical and political thing integrates with the new research in psychology, which is from the beginning. I mean, this is with babies, like practically from birth. They are engaged in responsive relationship. So the loss, in other words, it's the voice that's out of relationship that's called narcissistic. The other thing is the implication that, you know, either you say your feelings and thoughts or you're in relationship. I mean, that's honestly psychologically incoherent. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, saying all my feelings and thoughts are, you know, tonight, finally, I'm going to tell you what I think of you. <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, this is what, you know, this is how we educate children to find, first of all, that they have a language and that they have a sense of how you talk to a person, which is, you know, that's why I like Che's thing. They, you have to listen. And so, you know, having a voice, when Jane Eyre, to take that example, well, let's take the, the 11 year old in my study. She wanted to be called Elise. When she says, My house is wallpapered with lies, I swear, if you go to her house, you will see what she saw. Now, there's a huge amount of pressure on her not to say it. I mean, for obvious reasons. You know, um, movie after movie is made of girls that age. What was it called? Uh, well, I, I won't go into it. So the question is, how does she hold on to what she knows and live in the world that she has to live in? And she has to learn how to do that. That's not something that she automatically knows. So the assumption that... <laughs> You know, knowing what you know, I mean, the, the, the issue is psychological problems come when you don't know what you know, when you have to not know what you're in fact seeing or hearing or picking up. It's not about kind of speak, speaking out of relationship with people. And it seems to me the biggest challenge of human development is how to learn how to stay in touch with yourself and also stay in touch with other people and when this is what children supposedly should be learning. Paul may have wanted to say this, Jill Norgren. Um, when we talk about Roe, I think it's really interesting that you're identifying Roe as liberating these women, which it does in one, one level. And I think that in the movement, we uh, wanted to ignore how patriarchal the opinion was. And so in the first in the opinion in the first trimester, it is not the woman, but the woman and her physician. And of course, at that time, most physicians were men. <clears throat> so that as the excitement with the opinion died down and people uh, looked at the whole of it, they appreciated really how conservative the opinion was in many of its ways. See, I'm, it's interesting because I, I don't disagree with you at all. Of course, it was the woman with her doctor, usually men. But the point is, before that, the, nobody even thought that the woman had a voice 
or might be capable of having some thoughts that should even be in conversation with a doctor. And for the women in my study, that was a revolutionary, for many of them, idea. I, I, That's Aaron's, all. No, I, I think we're in, in agreement. But I think p part of what happened was that um, in the excitement for, for quite a while, people did not want to deal with the reality of the opinion. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. I don't disagree at all. I think the only thing that, from my point of view, is that what hadn't been recognized before that, to quite the extent, except, of course, it had, Virginia Woolf wrote about it when she wrote about the angel in the house, is that the good woman had no voice of her own. I mean, period. So it was a very psychologically radical idea for the court to say to the woman she had a voice, never mind, I mean, that was in consultation. And I'm not sure that the ideal, feminist ideal, is a woman speaking in no relationship with anybody. I mean, yes, there should be, you know, a sense of equality. Not, I mean, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with your point. I mean, it's not saying that it's completely up to the women. And I mean, I have a problem. And it's probably, you know, it tells you how radical I am. I have a problem with men having no voice. I mean, I really do. I mean, I think the idea that you know, the, the idea that everyone has a voice and we have to learn, it, part of our education and development is we have to learn how to talk with one another, which is easy if you think, you know, we all agree about everything. And obviously, you know, the, ch <laughs> now the challenge is how do you talk with people who obviously see the world differently from you? And I mean, that's not just, you know, if you go to, you know, sort of some, quote, foreign country. I mean, they're right in your house, the people who see things differently from you. I mean, so it's, that's the engagement with differences is what it was, that's what relationship is. And we have mistaken relationship for all being exactly the same, which is. I just um, encourage any of the students want to ask something. It's been, uh, yes. Okay. Um, can you bring it over? Oh, and for, I just wanted to oh, sorry. just speak loud. Yeah, sure. So, um, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I don't want this to sound self-aggrandizing, but it's going to. So, anyway, here. Um, um, some of my work has suggested that women moralize in everyday conversation more frequently than men. Um, where, you know, moralizing, broadly speaking, you know, apologizing, assigning responsibility for things, accusing people of things, and so on. Um, and I take it that that's consistent with your claim about, about you know, the voice, that, the distinctive voice of women being silenced here. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't say anything about the distinctive voice of women. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Maybe I should. Okay. I, but, uh, but the. Uh, a voice that speaks from a caring place when it comes to ethical issues, I should say then. Um, but I want to say, but then I guess my question is, if that is consistent with your theory, you know, how? And uh, yeah, that's the question. Thank you. Um, this, <laughs> thank you so much for raising these questions with me. I really appreciate it. Um, and the reason I stopped you is it's only in patriarchy that that is a distinctively, quote, feminine voice. It's really not. It's a human voice. What's interesting to me is that the initiation that forces a split from that voice or divides self from relationships, at which point you have narcissism and you have selfless caring, which is to me, I mean, that's the patriarchal couple if you, if, in a certain sense. Um, it's a human voice. Now, when that voice tries to, you know, kind of reach for moral justification, it's usually because it's speaking from a position of powerlessness. And the voice that speaks from a position of power doesn't need morality or anything else because it's just telling the truth and it's just speaking about justice and so forth and so on. So it's really important not to hear a conversation that is deeply, you know, embedded in power, in real power differences as, quote, to gender that, you know, somehow essentially masculine or essentially feminine. That's, that's really my point. A caring voice, honestly, is a human voice. I mean, I can give you example after example from little boys. 
Um, I'll give you one more example from a five-year-old boy, because I don't think people know these as, as, quote, male voices. These are not male voices, these are human voices. So a five-year-old is hit by his father in Christmas because the parents are splitting up and tensions in the household are running really high. And the five-year-old slams the door and the sister, older sister's finger catches in the door. Don't panic now, her finger was okay. However, the father really lost it and hit the little five-year-old. And then the next day, he was overcome with remorse. And he said to his son, I feel terrible that I hit you. I promise I'm going to try never again to do that. I really, it's not something, I feel really bad about that. And the little five-year-old turns to him and says, you're afraid that if you hit me when, I'll grow, when I grow up, I'll hit my children. Because this father had been hit by his father and had vowed to break the cycle, and the five-year-old is reading his fear. Now that's a human voice. The interesting thing is at 11, you hear it more in girls than in boys. And my point is something has happened to the boys that has led them to silence this voice or to hear it as feminine. To hear a caring voice as a feminine voice, not as a human voice. And the interesting discussion that Virginia is inviting, <laughs> I mean, I realize I'm the newcomer here, so you want to ask me about my work, but it really is a conversation we should engage is if now you take the kind of concerns that philosophers and political theorists have and you bring them in relation to this basic paradigm shift in the human sciences. You know, Damasio's book, Descartes' Error, the severing of thought from emotion is a manifestation of brain injury or trauma. The separation of the self from relationship, narcissism, is a manifestation of a breaking of relationship that usually involves a betrayal of love that is usually culturally sanctioned in the name of development, masculinity, whatever. So we have been reading culture, we've been mistaking culture for nature and then generating those stereotypes. I think we need to go right back to the drawing board and deal with the kinds of questions that Virginia was raising and that I'm sure, Carol, you would raise. <laughs> okay, I think our last question will be Ruth, and then we're going to... Well, <clears throat> that was really fascinating, and I just wanted to add that, you know, we, it was great that you could come, great that you could extend this, and you were, you know, part of the idea from the beginning, so I don't think you're an odd duck, but kind of in the middle of the water. I am an odd duck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, you're rich. I like being an odd yeah. duck. Yeah, I, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, it seems to me like this is, what was, is a wonderful extension of your work, and, you know, I'm a big fan of everything. Um, but at the same time, and, and no but, and at the same time, I was wondering if you thought about the consequences, because of, of course, women and girls who voice themselves, who do express themselves in terms of behavior as well as in terms of thought um, or writing or any aspect of it, they're often, you know, victims of violence. So I was just... Um, it seems like such, that's another logical consequence, not just in terms of domestic violence, which is, um, it sounds like you were interviewing and reaching out in both sexes in terms of that and genders, um, but also in terms of um, political violence. Uh, and political violence, not just you know in terms of Islam, but also in terms of all the other religions, because that was another aspect that we were trying to provoke. And then at the same time, in terms of leaders as well as warriors. So I actually had a student several years ago who explored the women that had, um, you know, were women suicide bombers. Both. Uh, so that's a very interesting question, and the question was why they did it, and it was very interesting. She she only had a very small sample because it's very difficult to get you know, that information. But the, so I was just wondering if you'd thought of that or know people working on it, or I'm sure there are. So. <laughs> yeah, my husband who's sitting right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he's working on violence. And I mean, he would say, I I'll speak for him, <laughs> that, you know, voice is the alternative to violence. And, and uh, I w we were telling Carol, we went to the movie The Gatekeepers last night. I don't know how many of you have seen it about the Shin Bet, the six leaders from Shin Bet and where they all come to at the end, and these are not people who are into care ethics. I mean, you know, I mean, that's not what they did professionally, was that violence doesn't work, and that the only solution is to talk. 
And, you know, one of them, former head of Shin Bet, says, you know, he's asked, you know, would you talk to terrorists? Would you talk to... He said, I'd talk to Ahmadinejad. I mean, he said, you know, and they have to see I don't eat glass and to see they don't drink petrol. And, you know, I mean, there is a, a sort of humanity to it. So, you know, violence is... When you see violence is when... It's when something... I mean, something has happened. And the first question is, what has happened... I, actually, I mean the violence to repress them. I, that's what I'm telling you. Okay. I, I, I mean, violence is a good way to, te to terrorize someone into silence. And it doesn't even have to be actual violence. It can be the threat of violence. I mean, you ask, how come? I mean, you look at what happens to the five, six-year-old boys who are not perceived as real boys. They are beaten up on the playground. I mean, there's violence right there. You look at the girls who are not seen as good girls, the kind of girls we want to be, and any violence is justified to them. I mean, nobody, they're like, they're like falling off the edge of the earth. You can do anything to them, nobody is going to say anything. So, you know, every time, I think, I think this is what Jim would say, every time you see violence, you have to say, what's happened here? Okay. Not, and that's part of the paradigm shift in the human sciences. It's instead of seeing violence as natural and part of our nature, and the question is how can we learn to control it, that violence follows. I mean, I think this is what Shay would say, a betrayal of what's right, a shattering of trust. I mean, Jim, my husband, works with really violent people. You want to say anything? Oh, you want me to <laughs> let, uh, let me just say, people will have a chance to talk to both of them and to Virginia down on 5109. So you should follow us there, Wine, Cheese, Treats. And please join me in thanking both our speakers for a fantastic presentation. <laughs>